It's Vanessa from Unmasked. There is new bombshell information that I received today regarding the Excelsior Springs, Missouri case. If you haven't seen my first video on all of the specifics in this case, I've linked it for you in the description below. It's not a very long video and I would highly suggest watching it so you're completely caught up on the details so far. This case is happening in Excelsior Springs, Missouri, and it's about 40 miles east of the Kansas City metro area. Like I said in the first video, I grew up not too far away from where this occurred, so it grabbed my attention immediately and I've just been kind of keeping an eye on it. After the initial reporting when the 22-year-old victim TJ escaped from Timothy Hazlitt's basement torture chamber, it went completely quiet. One reason for that is that everything was sealed for a month. I'm not sure if they're going to ask to have things sealed again for any longer to just delay the public from getting them, but not much information has been put out in the past few weeks. We do know that the victim was a 22-year-old woman that is referred to in court documents as TJ. Timothy Hazlitt Jr. picked her up from Prospect Avenue in downtown Kansas City, Missouri in September and held her captive in his basement while torturing her for a month. She managed to get free from her restraints and bravely freed herself and escaped on Friday morning, October 7th of 2022, and then went banging on doors in the neighborhood, pleading for help. The victim was a black female wearing latex lingerie and a dog collar that was padlocked around her neck and was restricting her breathing to the point where she was gasping for air. She had been repeatedly assaulted, whipped, and starved and was estimated to be under 80 pounds. When police searched Hazlitt's residence, they found the dungeon type of room in the basement just as the victim had described. Hazlitt had built the room himself for the specific purpose of kidnapping, torturing, and murdering women. She also told witnesses that Hazlitt had killed her friends. She kept repeating, he killed my friends, they didn't make it out. No other comments were followed up on regarding that statement that she made. I do not think we have any reason to doubt her claims whatsoever, never have. I also understand that the woman that was being held hostage had not been reported missing. I do think that's important and will be important as we get more information and as this plays out. We also got the extremely disturbing information that Hazlitt's eight-year-old son was staying with him in the residence at the time that he had the victim captive in his basement. I know that many of us have felt since day one that this was going to be a case where there were other victims and that this was much bigger than what was initially reported. I do have some new information that I was given today that I'm going to share with you, so let's get into it. A temporary restraining order was filed by Hazlitt's ex-wife yesterday asking that he not be permitted to have any contact with their minor child. The temporary restraining order was granted and there is a hearing set in person for November 15th at 4.30 p.m. If you're not familiar with restraining orders, after the temporary is granted, there's a certain amount of time before both parties have to attend a hearing to see if there's enough evidence to support granting a permanent restraining order. I would assume that the permanent restraining order will be granted for lifetime considering the circumstances. In addition to that, on October 18th, the owners of the house that Hazlitt was renting at 301 Old Orchard Road in Excelsior Springs filed a petition for immediate possession of their property, breaking Hazlitt Jr.'s lease. In the petition, it reads that Hazlitt signed a one-year lease on January 12th of 2022 and was paying $745 a month in rent. I really do feel awful for these owners as well. It also reads in the petition that due to the crimes committed on their property, that Hazlitt has drastically affected the value of their property and that they will have large expenses for the repairs and to fix everything that was done and therefore feel that the lease should be null and void and want to immediately seize their property back. So here is the bombshell news that I was told today. We saw that after investigators had conducted a three-day search of the property on Old Orchard Road, that along with the crime scene tape, they had constructed this chain-link fence around the entire house, which 
even those of us who follow true crime every day, that's just not something that you see very often. That fact, along with the number of blue barrels that were witnessed being removed from the basement where the victim was held and where he has this torture dungeon room, and add that with the claims of the victim that he had killed other women, those were all pretty good indicators that there is much more to come with this case. I was told today by a very reliable source and a very close lifetime friend of mine that there were indeed human body parts that were discovered in the blue barrels that were removed from Hazlitt's residence. I know it's a sick and horrible thought, but honestly, it's not that surprising based on what we know so far. Now, remember, we were also told back in the end of September, I believe it was September 27th, that there was no serial killer taking women from Prospect Avenue in that area. And then, you know, two weeks later, a woman from Prospect escapes claiming that there are other victims. And that's not meant to be disrespectful to law enforcement in any way. I respect what they do. I couldn't do it, but it is just the facts. I will say on the other end that the PD did state in their defense that they only can work open investigations on missing persons reports that are filed. And this particular victim allegedly did not have a missing persons report filed on her. So there's both sides of the argument, I suppose. That said, it looks like there was indeed validity to the concerns of community members that have been circulating for months. So of course that leads us to the natural questions of how many victims are there? Have they been reported missing? And how long has Timothy Hazlitt Jr. been torturing and killing women? Is this a new thing for him or does it date back farther and into different areas where he's lived? We did hear from some people who knew him or know him that over the past two years, there has seemed to be a marked mental and physical decline. He's even had a few well checks called in by friends and family. So those are definitely very interesting and I think necessary things to dive into. His past behaviors, any red flags, or possibly any incidents that may have gone unreported. We will have to wait longer for those answers, it seems, and I will continue to bring you any new updates on this horrific case out of Excelsior Springs, Missouri. I think about the victim that escaped on October 7th almost daily, and I really hope that she's healing and doing okay despite the absolute nightmare that she's been through. Our thoughts also go out to any other victims that they may find and their families. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so that you'll be notified when I put out any new videos on this case or any others. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.